Good morning. My name is Renee Flagg. I'll be reading the scripture lesson today. Um, I want to encourage you to get out your Bibles or your phones to read along with the scripture this morning. Our first lesson is from the book of Exodus, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Exodus is near the beginning of the Bible, and it follows Genesis. Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of this country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Second reading you can find in your bulletin. It is Psalm 91, 1 through 2, 9 through 12, and 14 through 16. This scripture will be read responsively. <clears throat> you who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. The Lord declares, those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will show by them and show them my salvation. Our third lesson is from the book of Revelation. <laughs> Chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. This is the last book of the Bible. Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his God, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, 
for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Our gospel today is from John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. And this can be found in the beginning of the New Testament, and it is the fourth book of the gospel. John 14, 1 through 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Renee. I invite you to get out the sermon outline that is in your bulletin. It would be helpful, I think, to take some notes, especially if in a life group that's going to be talking about that, what happened this morning, this week. We're con concluding this series titled, This Is Us, God's Word, Our Story. It's a series about identity. Who are we? How do we define ourselves? And we understand that God's Word is the Bible. And in this sermon series, we're exploring seven great themes of the Bible. Creation, rebellion, chosen, redemption, living. Those are the ones we've done so far. Today, we're going to look at promise. And then throughout this series, we keep coming also back to the fact that community is a major theme of the Bible. In fact, it shows up in all the themes. It shows up on almost, almost every page of the Bible, that we're created to be in relationship. The goal is for us to more deeply understand God's written word, the Bible, and to see that God's word is our story. I hope that over these last six weeks, you've learned a little bit more about the Bible but more than that, I hope that you've taken a step to see that, that God's word is your story. And your story is God's word that this is us. God's word is us. As God defines for us who we are according to his word. We all have a faith story to share. All of us do. In fact, the leadership of St. Luke hopes that in the days to come, we're going to be able to capture some of your stories and share them, because it's so encouraging to hear those stories of faith, because we all have a story to share. So, do you have some of these at home? Photo albums. How many have photo albums at home? Okay, I think in recent times, it's maybe more electronic, but we have photos. This is a picture of my shelf. In my house with all my photo albums, we just have lots of them. Although it's interesting, right? The older kids, the first kids, a lot more pictures of them <laughs> than the later ones. And I remember we'd send those, those roll of film away. To, I think it was Clark Labs in Chicago. And we were so excited when we'd get them in the mail. We always got double copies so we could give some to the grandparents and other folks. And their albums are filled with those photos. We often tell our story with photo albums, don't we? As we page through. I see this at funerals. The loved ones of the person that's passed away will make a boards with pictures on them or, or a video. 
that tells the story of that person's life in photographs. As you page through a photo album, you say, this is us. This is our story. Well, I want you to imagine today that the Bible, God's Word, is like a set of two photo albums. Okay, the first album, written before Jesus, our story written before Jesus, we can call that the Old Testament, probably better to call it the Hebrew Scriptures, because it's written in Hebrew. And there's 39 books in that album from Genesis to Malachi. We remember that there's 39 books in the Old Testament because the word old has three letters and the word testament has nine letters, 39 books that tell the sto- our story before Jesus came. And then the second album, smaller, is the album after our story after Jesus came. We'll call it the New Testament. It was originally written in the language of Greek. And there's 27 books in that album from Matthew to Revelation. Remember that there's 27 books because how many letters in the word new? Three. How many in Testament? Nine. You multiply them together, you get 27. You had 27 and 39 and you get 66 books in the albums of God's word, the Bible. So here's the story, our story in pictures in the first album, the Old Testament written before Jesus. The first set of photographs you come about has this caption on the top, creation is our story. How many of you do scrapbooking? Like you make your photo albums real fancy. Well, this is like what you put at the top of those pages with photographs. Creation is our story. There was a time... When each of us did not exist, we were not little spirit children up in heaven waiting to parachute down to earth. We did not exist. There was a time when nothing existed, only God. And God, through his word, said, let there be, and there was. And there was a time when he said to each of us, let there be, and we were, we came into existence. We are created by God. Creation is our story. The second set of photographs show this. Rebellion is our story. In that set of photographs, we have photographs of the thoughts and the words and the actions that we've taken that rebel against God's values, that break God's values, that break God's heart. I was looking at some of those pictures recently. You know, there's a lot of St. Patty's Day pictures in that. I I don't know why that is. Those are pictures we'd rather not have, and yet they're a part of our story that we've rebelled against God and violated his actions. Rebellion is our story. The third set of photographs show this. Chosen is our story. God is a God that chooses people. One time he chose a particular man named Abram and his wife Sarai. And he created a great nation out of them, his chosen people, the Hebrews. And we know, as we talked about a few weeks ago, that he's chosen us as well. Chosen is part of our story. In fact, there's pictures in this as I look at that part of the album and and God choosing us, naming us, in our baptism, choosing us as his very own. In fact, this is going to be crazy to think about, but... There's a picture in that section for each of us before time began. Where God is choosing us. The word they use in the New Testament is predestined us. He chooses us. Chosen is our story. Now when we think of word chosen, we think of those chosen people, the Jews. And the reason that God, the primary reason that God chose the Jews was to bring in Jesus. The whole first album of God's word points to Jesus. And so when we get now to the second album, the New Testament, the pictures in that album at the beginning are all Jesus. His birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. Jesus is 
the fourth great theme of the Bible. But there's a lot we could say about Jesus. And so we, we thought about what are some words that describe what Jesus did for us. And a few weeks ago, we, we listed a number of them. Adoption and forgiveness, joyous exchange, justification, reconciliation, salvation are words that describe what Jesus did for us. And so on each of those pages would be one of those words and then pictures of us and how God has saved us and forgiven us. We just chose the word redemption. Redemption is a word that comes from commerce. It means to pay the price of. And especially we think about how Jesus paid the price to set us free. Redemption is sometimes used for the redeeming of slaves. And we say that Jesus paid the price to set us free from the slavery to sin and death and evil. So as we look at the photographs on the page, on that page, at the top it says redemption is our story. There's your photograph. In fact, your photograph is on all those parts, those themes of the Bible. And, and here it is again, your photograph right there of Jesus setting you free, setting me free. My photograph's there as well. And here, part of the photographs on this page, there's a picture of Jesus on the cross, dying on the cross. And, and this, is a kind of, this is another photograph that's there. You look at there, and, and there's a picture of the inside of Jesus thinking when he was dying on the cross. In his divine mind, he's thinking of you. There's a picture of you in his mind when he's dying on the cross. In fact, I, I doubt that Jesus had a wallet. But if he did have a wallet, do you know whose picture would be in there? Your picture. And, and I would imagine on the cross, as he's dying on the cross, he would have asked one of the angels to pull his wallet out and to put your picture in front of them, him so he could see who it was that he was given his life for to redeem you, to set you free from all that holds you in bondage. Redemption is our story. Now, before I go on, I, I just want to share with you something I've observed as I've, we've paged through this, these photo albums of your story, God's Word, the Bible, and seen pictures of you in all those parts. You know, when I look at those pictures, most of the time you're with people in those pictures. Which teaches us this, that community is our story. We were created to be in relationship. We're created to be in community. That's how God made us. And that shows up in all those pages on the album. And really every page of God's word that were created to be in relationship. So now we come to the sixth set of photographs and the sixth great theme of the Bible. You know, I'd like totally skip that one, didn't I? Go back. Okay, I just totally skipped that one. That was one I forgot. Living, living a new life. Let me talk about that for just a moment. In this section of the album, there's pictures of you. And me, and you know what we're doing in those pictures? We're living for other people. We're living to serve, invite, and give for other people. We're living to meet their hopes and hurts. We're, we're living to invite them to know Jesus. We're, we're giving of our treasures so they can be helped. See, that's what happens when you become a follower of Jesus. You stop living primarily for yourself and you start living primarily for others. So there's pictures of that. And then there's the community, one that I already talked about. And so now we're going to the sixth set of photographs, which is promise. Promise is our story. Here's what I want you to understand from today. God makes promises. That's how God works. For whatever reason, God said, one of the ways that I exist as I make promises. He makes promises to us about our future. And this is why the word hope is such an important word for followers of Jesus. 
Our new hope in Jesus is that God will honor the promises he's made to us about our future. Because there's going to be a day, right? There's going to be a day when this life ends and we die. And then we hope that God will be faithful to his promise. Raise us from the dead into the eternal life with God and with others in the earth-like paradise that Jesus has prepared for us. That's our hope. That's the hope that we have and the promise that God made for us. God makes promises. The question is, does God honor his promises? Can we trust God's promises? Is there evidence for us to trust in God's promises. Well, let's look at briefly these albums. I'm going to move quickly through them. I'm not going to look up all the passages that are listed in your outline. But let's look at that first album, the Old Testament. So it's 3,000 years before the birth of Jesus. God calls this man Abram and his wife Sarai, and he makes a promise to them. Their names eventually became Abraham and Sarah. And the promise he said is, I'm going to make you a great nation. That's the chosen people, the Hebrews. And he also made a promise to them that they'd have a promised land where Israel is today. Well, about 1,200 years after that, they've become a great nation. There's, There's millions of them. But they aren't in the promised land. In fact, they're not in the promised land. They're in bondage in Egypt. So they're wondering, is God going to honor his promise? And so God comes to a man there named Moses. It was about the year 1450. And he says to Moses, I made a promise to your fathers, to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And part of the promise was that they would have a promised land, the land of Cana. And I'm going to honor that promise. And so he tells Moses, that he's going to free them out of slavery in Egypt. Did God honor that promise? Yes, he did. We we can see later on in the book of Exodus chapter 12 and in the book of Joshua chapter 3, it shows them leaving the promised land. In fact, leaving bondage and going to the promised land. What was so crazy about that, the Egyptians were so intent to let them get out that they gave them a bunch of gold and silver to say, Take this with you just to get out of here. And so they, in a sense, kind of plundered Egypt without any effort on themselves. God just gave them to them. And then in Joshua chapter 3, it describes them on the the edge of the promised land, the east side of the Jordan River as they're about to go over. and, And it describes in those verses that I've listed there how they crossed the Jordan River, entered the promised land, and began to settle there. Well, it didn't all go well for them all along. In fact, about 800 years later, in the year 597 B.C., a group of an empire called the Babylonian Empire invaded the Promised Land. And they captured the Jews. They laid a terrible siege on the city of Jerusalem destroyed the temple, and they took him into captivity. And it was a very difficult time for 70 years. And at that point, in fact, actually before it happened, this one verse I'm going to have you look up. Look up Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah, if, if you go to the middle of your Bible, you're going to find a book of Isaiah, and it's the next book right after that. Jeremiah, one of the major prophets Even before they go into bondage, God makes a promise that he's going to bring them out of bondage. So Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10, it says this. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Did God honor that promise? He did. We see in the book of Ezra, in the verses listed there, 70 years later, 
God led them out of bondage in Babylon, and they began to move back into the promised land and begin to build the temple. God is faithful to his promises. God had promised the chosen people, the Hebrews, a promised land. By the way, who lives there now? I mean, there's a lot of people that live there, Palestinians and others, but it's the homeland of the Jews now. God is faithful to his promise. Now, you might say, well, is there time, Pastor, where God didn't honor his promise? I want you to look up this verse. It's the, in the book of Haggai. You probably may not have ever looked at that book. It's, Haggai is right near the end of the Old Testament. So about three-fourths of the way through the Bible, you're going to come to a couple Z books, Zephaniah and then Zechariah. But Haggai is right between them. It's just a little book. Haggai chapter, he's a prophet, a minor prophet. Haggai chapter 2, verse 9. This is part of the promise that God made when they came back out of bondage in Babylon. It says this, the Lord's, they're, they're laying the foundation of rebuilding the temple. Some would call that the second temple. And it says this, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord God Almighty. In other words, God says, this temple that you're rebuilding, it's, the glory is going to be greater than the glory of the first temple, which was Solomon. Well, did God honor that promise? I'm not going to look it up, but if you look at that passage in Ezra that's listed there, when they start laying the foundation, people are cheering. They're celebrating. But there's a group of old guys, older men and women, who remember what the first temple looked like, and they're weeping. Do you know why they're weeping? They're like, this one's not going to be as great as the other one. It's going to be smaller. Now, I want you to notice the promise that God made wasn't that the building necessarily would be bigger, but the glory of the place. That's important to remember. So did God honor that promise? You see, the temple that God was, was speaking about when he said to Haggai, the, the glory of this temple is going to be greater, the, of this place is going to be greater than the former, he wasn't talking about a physical temple. King Herod would eventually rebuild that second temple, and it kind of rivaled Solomon's temple. But that's not the temple God was speaking of. Now I want you to look at John chapter 2. John is the fourth book in the, in the New Testament. It's about three-fourths of the way through the Bible. John chapter 2. Verse 19. Jesus is with his disciples. Jesus has just done a little act of civil disobedience in the temple. He tipped over some tables and he chased out the money changers. And he, he said, you've made my father's house a, a marketplace. And then the, there's some Jews there, Jewish leaders, and they're wondering of Jesus. They say in verse 19... Verse 18, they say, what sign can you show us to prove you have the authority to do this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and I will raise it in three days. And they said, three days? It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? Like, how's that going to happen? Verse 21 says, but the temple he'd spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples recalled that he had said this. Then they believe the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. Sometimes when God makes a promise, he doesn't answer that in the time we think he should answer it. And sometimes he answers it differently than we imagine he should answer it. But when he does answer that promise, when he does fulfill that promise, it's greater than we could have imagined. And this is an example. It wasn't a physical temple. It was the temple of Christ's body who, when he was raised from the dead, was glorified. And because he rose from the dead, so shall we. God answer, answered that promise, and it was greater than they imagined. God makes promises. And the evidence shows that God fulfills his promises. 
And the best indicator of that is past behavior, right? What's the best indicator of future performance? Past performance. So what are the promises for our future that we hope God will fulfill? We read in John chapter 14 today when Jesus says, now, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me and in my Father's house. There are many rooms. That King James says many mansions. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself. When we look at that part of God's photo album, there's a picture there of the place God has prepared for you forever. In an earth-like paradise that Jesus has prepared. It's there waiting for you. That's a promise. Look at... 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians is uh, one of the Paul's letters. It follows the book of Romans. Chapter 15, verse 51, it says this. Listen, I tell you, mystery, we shall not all sleep, we shall all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we shall be changed. The promise is that this perishable nature, this, this body that decays and ages and dies, will be replaced by an imperishable, an immortal body. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. That's just a couple books, a few books after 1 Corinthians. It says this, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. We're going to receive the glorious body of Jesus, and that's not like some Arnold Schwarzenegger thing, okay, glorious body. I mean, this is, this is the body of Christ, and the glorious body he has. And then one more passage, last book of the Bible. That we read today from Revelation chapter 21. It says this. There's going to be a day. This is a promise. When God brings in a new heaven and a new earth. That's why I believe our eternal existence is going to be an earth like paradise. It won't be like the old one. Because that's passed away. And he, Jesus says I'm making all things new. And then when I make all things new. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old, older things have passed away. That's the final picture in the album of the New Testament. Will God honor those promises? His past behavior would indicate so. But you know, dear ones, that's not really the most important question today. The most important question is this. Will your picture be on that final page? Will your picture, your photo, be in that final page of God's album? It's been all the way through it before. In your creation, in your rebellion, in your being chosen, in your living, in your redemption, in the community around you. But that final page, that promise, will your photo be there? If you came in today, dear ones, if you came into worship today not knowing for certain that if you, would, if you died today that you would be in heaven forever, if, if that was something you were uncertain about, I'm going to invite you to take a step of faith. If you're ready to do that, so that you have the assurance that on that final page of the album is your photograph. You can use your own words to do that, your own prayer. There is in the sermon outline a prayer, if you want to use that, to surrender your life to Christ. In the words of the song we're going to sing, I'm going to invite the band to come up now. It talks about how soon and very soon we're going to be with the Lord. That can be your prayer of saying, I, I believe these words. When you come up for Holy Communion here in a few minutes and you receive the body and blood of Christ, that can be your time of saying, I accept your promise for me and that my picture is in that final page of the album. Let's pray today. Father, in these next few moments, we ask that you would deal with each of us, that you'd come to each of us wherever we're at, you, that you'd give us the reassurance of our eternal life with you, 
And for those that have not yet taken that step of faith, that we'd be moved to do that and to receive eternal life. Lord, we know this is your promise to us, and we accept that promise soon and very soon. Amen.